Hey all. So, Ethereum and transactions per second, usually that's a combination you don't really want to read on the internet. It's usually, those sentences sound bad. And uh, what I wanted to kind of talk about today is that usually when you read about transactions per second and Ethereum is how Ethereum sucks and your favorite Ethereum killer just rules all. And I, was, uh, I wanted to talk about it a bit how much truth there is to it. There's always, the truth is always somewhere in between, but let's try to dig a bit deeper into it. Now, before we do, a little bit of a detour. I don't know if you've probably, most of you heard about The Boring Company. It's one of Elon Musk's company. The, the goal of the company is to dig tunnels uh, underneath large US cities like LA and somehow try to speed up a uh, transportation system, somehow try to avoid uh, the traffic. And, uh, well, a lot of people would like to do the things that he wants to do, but the challenge is that tunnels are prohibitively expensive, so everybody says it cannot be done. And, uh, well, Musk had this really nice idea, or really nice questions, rather, that, okay, when we say that a tunnel is prohibitively expensive, is it because physically it's impossible to construct it faster or cheaper, or is it because we socially accept it that it's prohibitively expensive? And the answer generally is, that while a tunnel has a certain diameter because it needs to uh, contain a ventilation system, uh, emergency exits, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but if you take a look at it a bit closer, the only thing it truly needs to fit is one car. The ventilation system is necessary because uh, most cars are combustion engine cars and they need oxygen. So without oxygen, the cars just stop. But if you just switch everything over to electric vehicles, boom. No more ventilation system, or at least a much smaller one. Emergency exits are obviously needed unless you take the control out of people's hands and you just automate everything. You just let the AI drive. In theory, no accidents happen. Again, the tunnel can be reduced. And plus, there are a few more uh, things that you can explore. But the interesting thing is that the observation here is that physics kind of limits you to certain aspects, and then we construct a lot of extras on top. But the, the true value, or the, in this certain case, the uh, particular case, the true cost of a tunnel is kind of limited by physics, the rest we just pile on top. Now, to go back to Ethereum, what does this mean for us? Everybody on the internet always says that Ethereum does not scale. And uh, that's a very, very hard thing to unpack, it's very ambiguous, but what people kind of say, or want to say with if Ethereum does not scale, is that ex Ethereum is too expensive for them. This is, again, a bit ambiguous. What does it mean that Ethereum is too expensive? Is a Tesla car too expensive? Well, I mean, it depends on your salary and depends on what you want to use it for. So saying that Ethereum is too expensive, that's too subjective. But we can agree that Ethereum is expensive. Now, expense is kind of driven by capacity, uh, supply and demand. So if you would like Ethereum to be cheaper, we, cannot, we can never make it cheap, because cheap, I mean, unless it's free, it's always too expensive for somebody. But if we'd like to make it cheaper, then the two things we can do is either raise capacity or lower demand. And the EF is actually doing both of them. Lowering demand, we're trying to drive people towards L2s. And raising capacity, well, let's see, can we do that? And uh, well, capacity is kind of, people kind of define capacity as transactions per second, which is, again, super ambiguous because, I mean, is a plain transaction, an ETH send, a DEX swap, an NFT auction, these are all transactions, and these are absolutely not comparable. So what Ethereum actually does under the hood is that it uses gas to abstract out the disproportionality of transactions. Now, Ethereum currently runs uh, at 1.1 mega gas per second on average, and we kind of feel that this is a pleasant number. However, there are other networks like Avalanche and the Binance Smart Chain who are really pushing the limits. And then the question is that while they are essentially internally geth, at least the EVM, they have the same state, so how can they push it faster? Is there something they're not telling us? And there's a really nice hint there that kind of points to what they're not telling us. Uh, Binance Smart Chain one year ago was running at 25 mega gas per million gas per second, and currently it's running at seven. So we can say that the Binance Smart Chain guys are super smart and they optimized geth, but how did they unoptimize it one year later? So what happened there? And the answer is that uh, gas is a fairly bad approximation of how much it costs to run a transaction, because usually we have four aspects to a system load. You have CPU load, memory, disk, and network. 
Now, running a transaction last year and this year takes the same amount of CPU, same amount of memory, same amount of uh, network traffic. However, disk is a bit interesting. Specifically, I won't go into the detail, but this is how Ethereum stores its state. It's kind of all the accounts are laid out flat, and we have a cryptographic tree structure on top to just try to prove that everything is correct. And well, since this is a logarithmic structure, we have every node has 16 children. Every mathematician will say that this is super efficient. We don't talk about it anymore. Yeah, the problem there is that as time passes and the state becomes bigger, this logarithm starts to appear and starts to cause troubles. Specifically, currently, Ethereum has about 170 something million accounts, which translate into a state try of depth eight. That's nice. That's a perfectly acceptable try depth. So when we try to do a transfer, let's say Alice tries to transfer one ETH to Bob, then we need to create 18, sorry, 15 new try nodes. We just need to create eight for the new account of Bob, Alice and eight for the new account of Bob. We have a shared root. OK, 15 per transaction, still not bad. Yeah, the problem is that we store the state in level DB, which is another try, which means more levels. And LevelDB specifically stores data in seven levels, which amplifies my 15 writes into 105 writes. And in order to actually calculate the new Merkle path, I need the old one too. So that doubles my input-output operations. So we're up at 200 plus input-output operations per transaction. And of course, mining in Ethereum, it's not run Ethereum, isn't run by a single node, so we have a miner, and then the block is mined, and then propagated, mined, propagated. So every transaction is kind of ran twice. So if we do that, essentially what we arrive at is that running a single transaction will require 420 input-output operations on the network. That doesn't sound bad, except when you start laying out uh, the exact numbers of different technologies. Uh, HDDs are kind of capped by their seek times. You have the various SSDs with various transports, Serial Atta, NVMe, PCI Express 4. And I mean, I won't go into the numbers, but the idea is that every hard drive technology has its limits. And if we just take those limits and uh, divide them at 410, we get some super hard numbers on what is possible. And Ethereum currently tries to uh, aim for PCI Express 3 NVMe hard drive, so it means that Technically, 857 give or take transactions is the absolute maximum that the Ethereum network can do. Uh, the truth is we are actually doing more than that now. And the way we are doing more is uh, these limits are only relevant if every single transaction pushes everything to disk, so kind of like an archive node. In our case, what we try to do is to try to keep as much data as possible in memory, because then all of a sudden we don't have to um, screw around too much with disk. So what does it mean to keep stuff in memory? There are actually two, um, two ways in which we can keep data in memory. One, of, one is actually done by the operating system for free for us. If you have a 64 gig machine, the operating system will actually use the whole state, uh, I'm sorry, the whole RAM, everything to keep to cache disk. So whenever you try to access all the data, most of the time it will access it from memory. And the other thing that Geth does is that we try to do state pruning. And straight state pruning kind of means that if Alice sends one ether to Bob, then one ether to Claire, and then one ether to Dave, then these, all these intermediate states that Alice's balance was decreased by one, two, three ether, you don't really need to save that. It's fine to just save the last state. And these are nice optimizations that allow us to reduce the number of input-output operations and thus to actually raise the transaction per second capacity, capacity of the Ethereum network. However, this omits a very interesting detail, and that is that system memory is limited. So if the operating system is really nice at caching stuff in RAM, if I have enough RAM to fit the entire state into it, or we can use a very nice in-memory pruning in Geth if we have enough RAM to fit it into it. Now, I'm not entirely sure what the average uh, Geth uh, Ethereum node user has, how much RAM, I don't know, 32, 64 gigs, that's probably on the high end. But the Ethereum state is currently over, over that, way over. And then what happens is that the more you overflow it, the more often the operating system produces a cache miss, or page miss, page fault, and that results in actually reaching down to disk. And the same happens with pruning. 
I can prune, I can stuff a certain amount of data into our pruning algorithm, but as the blocks go, grow, as the state grows, I either need to keep raising that limit, or I keep leaking more and more and more info data down to disk. And this is actually a self-referencing cycle, because the, the more the state grows, the less RAM I have to operate in it. So the faster the state grows, the less RAM I have up to operate in it. And what happens is that I am eventually reverting back to my original hard, um, original transaction per second cap produced by the hard drive. And the question is, essentially based on this slide, we kind of see that a big state is bad. But how big is bad? I mean, it's very hard to put a number as to how big is bad. What we can try to see is, okay, how fast does it grow? Because the faster it grows, the worse it gets, or the faster it gets worse. And uh, last week on a Sunday, so Sunday is considered a pretty idle time for Ethereum, and pretty much nothing happens on the network. Uh, the Ethereum state grew by approximately, I don't know, 0 0.64 account per second, eight storage slots. That doesn't say absolutely anything to anyone, not even to me, it's just a random number. If we look at how much actually uh, it weighs uh, byte size, it's approximately, I don't know, 600 and something bytes per second, which is 55 megabytes per day, 20 gigs per year. Okay, those numbers start to make a bit more sense. But this is actually just the raw data, just the useful data that, okay, Alice has one ether, or Bob, Bob has two ether. It doesn't contain any of these Merkle proofs. If we actually just dump all of those numbers in there, I won't read through the numbers, we get kind of an extra double the size. So all of a sudden, the Merkle tree weighs, I don't know, 40 gigs per year. That's the addition. But this was interpolated from a Sunday. During the week, it might be two, three times more. So it, it kind of fluctuates. It's kind of hard to just say that, okay, this is the growth. But let's say I would say maybe 50 gigs, 100 gigs per year. That is the growth of the Ethereum state. I'm not talking about blocks, I'm not talking about receipts, I'm not talking about anything, just the raw state that's needed for contract execution. And uh, the question is, is this a lot or is this acceptable? And I don't know, I mean, um, if I have 64 gigs of RAM, then piling 100 gig every year on top of it kind of exhausts it pretty fast. And uh, what does that kind of mean? What that means, <laughs> to be a bit uh, apocalyptic, is that uh, Ethereum and all its forks is kind of like on a potential death trajectory currently, meaning that if you take any of the Ethereum networks, by Ethereum networks I mean mainnet or the Avalanche contract chain or the Binance Smart Chain or pretty much anything that is a fork of Ethereum, and if you just stick a constant transaction throughput on it, the state will grow. Maybe it's slower, maybe it's faster. In Ethereum, it grows at 100 gigs per second, but Binance Smart Chain at some point was, um, sorry, 100 gigs per year, but Binance Smart Chain was at some point running at 25 times our capacity, so that would be 2.5 terabytes per year. That's a nice number. And the problem is that the more that number grows, the higher RAM requirements we have. And the higher requirement, RAM requirements we have, the more and more data we flush to disk, the more IOPS we generate, and essentially we're hitting that brick wall. <coughs> that thingy, I mentioned those numbers, they are approximations. We can debate whether it's 2x larger, 0.5x smaller. It's the order of magnitude that counts. But those are the numbers that the hard drives impose on us. So the moment we revert to running on hard drives, the moment that our, those are, sorry, the, the hard limits. <coughs> so, but that still begs the question. Our mainnet is relatively slow compared to everybody else's mainnet. So does that mean that we just suck at it? Are others good at it? Or is the truth somewhere in between? And my answer is that our mainnet can actually do significantly more transactions per second than we, sorry. <coughs> it can do significantly more transactions per second than we allow. However, ooh, I appreciate it. Ooh, very nice. So, 
uh, our mainnet can do significantly more transactions per second than we allow it. However, the more we allow it to, to, I mean, the faster we allow it to grow, the faster we bring that brick wall closer. And it's kind of a race against time. Can we keep that brick wall far away so that it doesn't actually impact us in a very, very detrimental way? Or is that brick wall something that just arrives and Ethereum shuts down and game over? And usually there are some very nice proposals. We have the EIP4444 from Matt, I think. <laughs> Which essentially aims to get rid of um, historical chain segments. Unfortunately, that doesn't really help the state growth. We have shard blob transaction proposals which try to move as much data as possible to L2s, plus delete them afterwards at uh, L1. Okay, I'm sorry, I haven't talked in a while. <laughs> so, it, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, the shard blob transactions try to move as much data as possible as on top of L2s, the, and that little data that actually ends up on L1s, it's defined in a really elegant way to be able to be pruned off. But unfortunately, this neither of them really touch on, uh, on raising the capacity or moving this brick wall forward. And hmm, well, it's okay. <laughs> so as, as, essentially, the, we are kind of running out of time, and the only interesting solutions we have is state ranch, which was shut down. We have exponential costs, which is currently the current situation, or we have probably possibly stateless clients. And that's kind of the hopeful direction that we are going to towards. However, this does mean that there is no solution existing currently, and Ethereum has time. However, if you look at other chains which are pushing the limit super hard, the danger there is that they will actually beat out Ethereum on, uh, on chain growth, and they will actually beat us to the brick wall. And that's not a problem for us because we can see what happens when people reach the brick wall, and you can actually see it on a Binance Smart Chain. It's really interesting to dig through their issue tracker. But... Uh, it's a dangerous place to be at to arrive at the brick wall without a solution. So currently my takeaway is that Ethereum's transaction per second is deliberately low. We could push it significantly harder, but that would actually make it significantly harder for us or give us a significantly shorter time span to, to fix things. <coughs> it's definitely the smoke. Yeah. But... Um, I guess the good news is that we are trying and we have pioneers who are pushing it harder than us so we can learn from them. <laughs> and uh, thank you. <laughs> Aww. You made it. You made it. Wow. Barely. Yeah, but you still made it. You didn't hit any brick wall. Do we have anyone in the audience who has any questions for Peter about... Oh, who, who's first? Okay, great. Oh, yeah. Wait, we've got a... Uh, sorry, one behind you with a microphone. Um, yeah, thanks. Just quick question. So none of the things you talked about were like latency or internet related. No. So what if computers just get better fast enough? Um, that would be nice, but they don't. So the problem is that currently, so computers get better in certain areas, but uh, current limitations are kind of disk latency. And currently the best technology is PCI Express, Express NVMe hard drives, which have approximately 1 million I.O. operations per second, which translates to 2,500, 800 transactions per second. And there's nothing really coming that would make it significantly faster. So you could say that, okay, there are always some super fancy technologies that you could deploy in a data center or in a controlled environment or in, if you are willing to spend some crazy amount of money. But I'm, and I guess that's what kind of Binance uh, goes towards too, that they have a limited number of nodes, limited number of validators, and then you can just push them super hard and have super high hardware requirements. That's an option. 
Ethereum kind of tends to take the more public approach where anyone can run a node. I mean, it does have the costs. But if you want every, anyone who's willing to run a node be able to run a node, then you kind of need to keep the hardware requirements within reasonable levels. And I don't think there's anything coming for average users that can actually make it 10x better. So long story short, L2s are the way to go, and L1 needs to be kept in a reasonable shape. OK, uh, there was a second question here at the front. Uh, hopefully not a bad question. I run some nodes for Pocket Network, and uh, I run Aragon as the archive node, mainly because it's so much smaller uh, disk footprint than running Geth. Is there, are they doing something totally different? Is that applicable here, or is that some new technology? Thanks. Um, I'm not entirely sure I caught the question, but um, let me make an assumption, and then you can correct me. So I guess the question was somewhat around the lines that, uh, if Aragon is kind of smaller, then wouldn't Aragon be able to run more transactions per second compared less to Geth? And that's somewhat true. The problem is that that's why I highlighted how much raw data we add to the network. It doesn't matter whether it's Geth or Aragon, the raw data is kind of, that's the amount of data that gets added. And the Merkle Patricia 3, those operations per second, input-output operations per second, those are the raw operations required to calculate the proofs. Now, in the case of Aragon, they do all those operations in memory. But the catch is that it has to fit in memory. And once it doesn't fit, Aragon also, tries, or also starts to leak stuff out to disk. So again, it's, it's kind of like this trade-off. Uh, in order to do the Merkle partition calculations, you, you must do those operations. How much you can st store in disk depends on on your algorithms, but if this, sorry, how much you can store in memory, but if memory runs out, then you're falling back to disk and you're falling back to the brick wall. But yes, you have, you might have a different runway with a different data layout. But, but if can, I, can we move some more questions? Would that be all right? I'm sorry. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, what was the reception of Binance Chain's reduction of the uh, capacity of the TPS? And would that be potentially an option to vary <coughs> the TPS? Mm. <coughs> so the reason Binance Smart Chain, as far as I know, reduced the um, uh, gas limit, they are pushing it super hard, the state was growing super fast, and uh, the thing they hit, they had very, very strong machines. So they didn't hit the, the limitation that they couldn't process transactions. What they actually hit is that they couldn't synchronize. So if a new node was joining the network, it just could never catch up. And they realized that they just have to stop, have to slow down, because they don't have the algorithms necessary to handle that throughput. Now, again, the question is, Binance Smart Chain is using a bit different hardware. They are really pushing the hardware. I don't know. So they reduced it from 25 to 7. Whether this 7 is because that's the maximum they feel comfortable with, or I don't know why exactly 7. But it definitely was that they were, um, people had so many problems with running their nose that they just had to do something. OK, we have another question over here. Uh, so, yeah, so I have a couple of questions. So one of them is, you said that level DB, so we, we all know that level DB uh, is a suboptimal um, data structure basically to store uh, Ethereum state. So are, have you looked into other solutions or are you actively looking into other solutions as an interim uh, mm -hmm. optimization? A lot of people try to create an alternative database, but um, it's not really easy to create a new database from scratch. And the problem is that um, LevelDB also makes some uh, trade-offs. LevelDB actually is a very, very good system because it, it is very compact and it's highly performant. You could make something faster, but that could entail just the disk usage exploding. exploding. And the question is, OK, are you willing to be 1.5 oh, sorry, 1.5 times faster, but use 10x more disk space? 
Now, certain people are, certain projects are experimenting with creating their own uh, lab database. I mean, I think Parity at some point wanted to create their own database. Avalabs wanted to create their own database. I haven't seen anything working yet. It's definitely an interesting thing, but it is a very, very hard thing to do. And uh, other databases that are out in the market, essentially they are all, uh, all rely on the same fact, the same try structure. Okay, level DB stores the keys and values together, Rocks DB stores them separately. Now you have Pebble, which is kind of somewhere in between. There are variations, but as long as you have a tree structure with levels, you kind of somewhere introduce this amplification back. Okay, thank you. And the second question is, I heard at the time that there was somebody within EF researching a, a decentralized uh, storage solution, like a bespoke solution to, to do archiving. Is there anything? Uh, for decentralized state storage, I guess as not, if you want to store the historical state, that's very nice. I mean, you can definitely store it, but there you don't have the requirement to have instant access to it. Because, I mean, if you, you, I want to... I want to dig up what my account balance was last year, I can wait half a second or one second or two seconds. However, if I'm a full node that, want, that needs to run this block now, or I'm a miner and I have 100 milliseconds to create a new block, then I cannot rely on, um, on some remote nodes to give me the necessary data. So it just the uh, network latency will be too high for me to gather all the state data to be able to run that block. Okay. I think we're up for time. You survived Thank it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter.